actually see it later. So welcome. Uh, my name is Ricardo. I'm from the Sustainable Economies Law Center, and I'm going to be presenting um, the Bay Area Blueprint uh, Worker Co-op Academy info session with Hillary Abel and uh, possibly uh, Allison Lingain, who are both uh, co-founders of Project Equity, um, which provides support for worker cooperatives. Um, and they can talk a little bit more about what they do in a minute. Um, just a few things that we want to make sure just to set out uh, some guiding principles for our uh, talk today. What we hope everybody can get out of this is that uh, one is so that everybody gets excited about the Worker Co-op Academy that we'll be providing starting this September. Um, also, just to provide you the uh, basic uh, framework of the Bay Area Blueprint, the larger scope of our project and how the Worker Co-op Academy fits within um, that project and as well to um, talk about the specifics of the Worker Co-op Academy and to get questions from you and answer those questions um, as we get closer to uh, actually starting the Academy. So right now I'm gonna hand it off to um, Hillary to talk more about um, the Bay Area Blueprint. So. Can I say a little bit about yourself first? Oh yeah. So, who you are and what you do. Yeah, so um, I'm Ricardo. I'm the uh, Legal Services Program Director and Cooperatives Program Director at the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And the Sustainable Economy Law Center, or SELC, um, what we do is provide education, um, research, advocacy, and advice for just and resilient economies. So we work in areas from um, our food systems to transportation to housing um, to uh, employment and looking at how the law and how we can support either uh, changing the law or advising people on how to navigate existing laws to create worker-owned businesses and um, creating those resilient economic um, transactions and communities that we hope will, you know, build a, build a more just and equitable society. So that's a little bit about myself and Selk's work, and I'm going to hand it over to um, Hillary now. Let's see. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. So I'm Hillary Abel, and as Ricardo said, uh, together with Allison Lingang, who's also on the webinar, um, we're co-founding an organization called Project Equity, and we just launched in April after a couple of years of planning, and our mission is to increase economic resiliency in low-income communities by expanding worker ownership. And I'll say a little bit in a minute about why we think. It's probably some of the same reasons you all are on this call, but why we think worker ownership is such a powerful model for revitalizing communities and making our economy fairer for everybody, especially for, for workers who have very poor options in their, in their other um, job opportunities. And um, I'll just say a quick word about my own background. Um, even though Project Equity is new, this is work that I've been involved in for quite some time. Um, I was a worker owner at a worker co-op called Equal Exchange, which is based in the Boston area, but now works nationally and was, was one of the first, actually was the first company to bring fair trade coffee into the United States and is now one of the largest worker co-ops in the country. And I was there in the 1990s, so it was quite a while ago, um, but it was really exciting to be able to help build a worker-owned cooperative from the ground up and also to work with farmer cooperatives in Latin America and see how being in a co-op and selling to the fair trade market to, to other cooperatives especially, but in general to the fair trade market really changed, changed their lives. Um, and fast forward, you know, 10 or 15 years, I got into developing worker cooperatives locally here in the San Francisco Bay Area and was the executive director of a nonprofit called Wages for about eight years. And if people are, I think most of you are from the Bay Area, you may know about um, natural home cleaning or home green home and the other green cleaning cooperatives that Wages has developed. Um, <clears throat> so that was kind of my deep experience in helping others launch worker co-ops. And then I've done some consulting with the Evergreen Cooperatives in Cleveland and with some other co-ops in different parts of the country. And um, <clears throat> also wrote a paper called Worker Cooperatives Pathways to Scale, which is available on Project Equity's website. And you'll see the link for a download later in our presentation. And that was a great opportunity to look at the impact that worker co-ops are having around the country and also some of the barriers and limitations we're running up against as we try to scale up this model and make it available to more people. So Project Equity was founded to, to do that, to try to um, help worker cooperatives get to a larger scale where we have more of an impact on the local economy. Um, and we're really thrilled to be partnering with the Sustainable Economies Law Center 
and the Green Collar Communities Clinic of the East Bay Community Law Center. Those are our two main partners in this work called the Bay Area Blueprint, um, which I'll say a word about. <clears throat> so um, I know there's a lot of words on the screen here, just to do a really quick summary. <clears throat> so this Bay Area Blueprint is a one-year process that we just started in April of this year. It'll go through March of next year. And our goal is to, to look at how we can get the Bay Area to have um, easier access to worker ownership, especially for low and moderate income communities, which are <clears throat> the communities that our three organizations are focused on. Um, there's a, several other organizations that are partnering with us on the Blueprint as well, and just to name them, the Sustainable Business Alliance um, here in the Bay Area, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, and also Laney College. Um, <clears throat> and the main thing we just want you to know about the Bay Area Blueprint is it's sort of this broader process of which the Worker Co-op Academy is one component. And the other two components I won't go into in detail, but they're essentially two feasibility studies. One is on business opportunities for larger scale worker cooperative startups, and by that we mean co-ops that could employ 50 or more people eventually. So that's kind of more of a research to lay the groundwork for that kind of work. And the other is looking at converting existing businesses to worker co-ops. So we're doing some research on that as well, and we'll have some <clears throat> kind of analysis and campaign ideas to share at the end of the blueprint process. Um, so with that, I want to just say a word about um, why we think um, worker ownership is, is really worth replicating and making available to more people. <clears throat> Um, I won't go through the slide one by one, but you can see here, these are um, from the research that I did over the last couple of years, just some specific data points and trends that as I really looked at what information is out there to demonstrate the value of worker-owned cooperatives, and some of this is also from ESOPs, Employee Stock Ownership Plans. Um, <clears throat> that first data point is actually from wages where I used to work, and um, there is data that shows that the, the immigrant women who are the worker owners of those cooperatives on average actually increase their individual incomes by 158% within a year or two of joining the cooperative. So that's um, <clears throat> it's pretty powerful and there is data from other places as well that shows that worker co-ops, um, when, when they thrive, when they do well, they do provide the higher quality jobs and um, you know can be more efficient as businesses survive longer. There's a few studies in Canada that show that the resilience of cooperative businesses and even civic engagement can be enhanced. So I'm guessing that all of you who are here, if you're involved with co-ops or seriously considering getting involved, you probably um, kind of know this stuff intuitively, but we did want to share that there is actually not a ton of data, but some data to really prove that this is the case. And so our goal with the Bay Area Blueprint and also with the Worker Co-op Academy is to um, enable more cooperatives to thrive and deliver this kind of benefits and to make worker ownership more common, more normal, and just easier to do. Um, and then with the Worker Co-op Academy, we're going to be working with sort of smaller, <clears throat> smaller co-ops to help them grow and create good jobs. That's really the short version of the goal, the overall objective. Um, so very quickly, just a, a high-level overview as you can see on the screen, our objective with the Academy is to assist the formation and expansion of worker-owned businesses that will provide good jobs for low to moderate income workers. And as I said, that's, that population is kind of the, the focus of all of our organizations that are involved, and it's also the focus of the, the grant funding that we got to, to do this Academy. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the things we'll be looking for as we screen applicants for the Academy is whether they're working with low to moderate income workers or have the potential to create good jobs for, uh, for that uh, demographic of workers. And just very briefly, we wanted to start out by sharing with you that we see two phases to the Academy. Uh, the first phase is sort of the classroom phase that'll start in December and end in December of 2014. And it's going to combine um, shared classroom experience among the, the five to seven teams um, of people who are participating in the academy. And we'll also have sort of a customized program for each team, because as Ricardo will tell you in a minute, we're anticipating having a really interesting diversity of um, teams participating in the academy. And the topics, which we'll tell you more about in a bit, that we will cover to varying degrees of depth depending on the needs of the individual team, include business fundamentals, people and culture, um, cooperative structure and history, uh, governance and management within the cooperative context, and also legal aspects. Um, and then the other high-level thing for everyone to know is that the Academy is designed also to have a phase two 
um, but that'll probably be for just a subset of participants in phase one, and that'll include a deeper level of sort of business coaching and legal advice for those, those teams. So during the rest of this webinar, what we're planning to do is to share with you a little bit more about the participant profile of who the Academy is designed for and the different types of teams that would be a good fit to tell you more about the outreach and selection process and then to give you more information on the curriculum framework. And as Ricardo said, our goal is really to hopefully get you excited, um, but also help you figure out whether this is a good fit for what you want to do and, um, and the kind of support that we can provide. Uh, thanks, Hillary. So I'll be talking next um, just about our uh, participants and uh, who we're looking for to actually take part in the Co-op Academy. Um, so what we're trying to do is really have some impact in low and moderate income communities. So um, like Hillary was talking about, that's who we would hope um, either the worker members come from the low to moderate income community or that the jobs that they'll be creating with their cooperatives will be employing um, individuals from that community. So uh, through the Co-op Academy, what we're trying to do is to help three to five worker co-ops launch or grow. Um, and we'll be talking about the participants and how each participant um, group can help us do that. And in the actual Academy itself, we're hoping to have about five to seven teams of three people each. Um, so it's definitely a team academy uh, process. So we're looking for teams of people to be coming into our academy. And so a total, we'll have, we'll have about 15 to 20 participants um, actually in the course itself. Now what we're looking to do is work with uh, four different types of, um, oh, whoops, sorry, uh, four different types of uh, participants. So one is startups. So founders of new worker cooperatives um, or ones that have just started and are already operating. Um, so so that's, that's one profile is, that's, is the startup group. Another is expand. So members of existing cooperatives that are seeking to expand and grow. And we see that a lot of times um, with those existing co-ops that have small kind of, uh, you know, collective or consensus decision-making processes to expand and actually grow their business and start um, onboarding or employing new people. It's a difficult process and a difficult transition. And so what we're, we're helping, hoping to do is to help those um, current and existing uh, worker cooperatives to expand and really be able to grow and thrive. Um, the third group is uh, converters. So just typical conventional businesses that are looking to convert to cooperative ownership. <clears throat> we see this as something that we're going to be doing a lot more work on in the coming years as baby boomers are retiring and we want to really start implementing some support strategies uh, like the Co-op Academy to help uh, those typical businesses think of succession planning through selling to their employees and that type of thing. So that's the third group we're going to be working with through the Co-op Academy. And the fourth is uh, developers. So nonprofit um, organizations or business development organizations that are wanting to do uh, more worker cooperative development as a community economic development tool. So we'll have components in the curriculum that speak directly to those types of nonprofits or de business development organizations to help them understand what capacity um, they'll need and what training they'll need to be able to provide to really help uh, worker cooperatives get started in their community. Um, and let's see. And so uh, what we're trying to do is really look uh, when we're uh, assessing each team's application, we really want to try to find the um, teams with the highest likelihood that they'll actually create jobs by uh, going through the Co-op Academy. So that's what we're really, really looking for. Um, we, we don't want, uh, we would love to help everybody, but um, for those who are just thinking of an idea and they just have, um, you know, a, a vision of what they want, but they're not ready to um, start their business in the next year or two, the Co-op Academy isn't for them. The Co-op Academy is, uh, like I said, for founders of a new worker cooperative or one that's just started, um, existing co-ops, typical businesses looking to convert or existing nonprofits and business development organizations that are looking to do more cooperative development. Um, so as far as the um, timeline, 
we just want to let everybody know that um, there are some dates, some due dates. So June 11th, we are um, going to start, or sorry, June 11th is when we open the application process. And um, so teams have until August 1st to apply to submit their applications. And their applications can all be found at um, the website, uh, theselk.org backslash worker cooperative academy. Um, and there's a there's links at the end of this as well as um, if anybody needs that, I can send it to them. Um, starting in July uh, on the 21st, we're going to start having these team interviews. So we're going to be meeting with your teams or scheduling with you, meeting with your teams and assessing um, how ready you are to start your business, to convert it or to help um, businesses or organizations or people in your community to start worker cooperatives. So those will be between July 21st and August 8th. Um, Starting in August 15th, we'll start actually selecting participants. So the earlier that you can get your application into us, um, the better chance that we'll be able to review it, um, assess your situation, meet with you, and really do um, the needs assessment that's going to um, inform how the curriculum is designed particular to you. Um, so we'll be selecting from the 15th to the 29th. And then um, August 15th to September 8th is when we're asking all of those participants to confirm and commit uh, to the program with us. And so the Co-op Academy itself, we have a tentative start date of September 15th to August 1st is when we are planning to um, launch the Co-op Academy and the classes themselves. And we'll be ending um, in December. So. Um, and I'll pass it back to uh, to Hillary to explain the rest. Hi again, everybody. So, you know, I'm just realizing that it's probably good to just check with this point if there's anyone who's kind of having any trouble hearing us or any any kind of burning questions. What What we're planning to do next is walk you through the the curriculum framework and the topics that we're planning on covering and how we're doing this sort of iterative design in dialogue with um, the application process and with the applicants. Um, and then we'll, we're planning to have at least 20 minutes, if not more, for kind of Q&A after presenting that. But I did just want to make sure there's no kind of urgent um, kind of problems or urgent questions at this point. <clears throat> we good to go? Okay. Great. So the high level, we wanted to share with you the approach that we're taking to the curriculum. And as I mentioned before, we're seeing it as it's not just going to be a one-size-fits-all pro all program because we're expecting that our cohort and our participants won't be a one-size-fits-all group. And as Ricardo went through, we, we could have as many as four different types of, of projects in the mix. And maybe it'll be two or, or three of those types, but we're pretty sure everyone won't fit into the same category. And they'll probably also be at different stages of development. So we're planning to have sort of a hybrid where we have a shared experience that the whole cohort will go through and then a customized program that we'll talk with you about and develop together with each team. In terms of overall um, time commitment, we're currently planning on about 30 hours of classroom time for each team. And as Ricardo said, it'll start probably mid-December, maybe the very beginning of October, and go into <clears throat> kind of mid-December. So it would be roughly 30 hours over three months. And as you think about this for yourself, we also encourage you to plan around having some work to do between the workshops, because as Ricardo said, this is really about helping you guys launch and or grow businesses and that'll take that depends on what you guys do outside of the workshops more than what we do together inside the workshops so kind of estimating maybe it's four to five hours a week uh, per for each person participating roughly speaking um, and the other aspects about how we're designing that's fine um, is that what I've seen in the world of um, kind of cooperative development and in many cooperative initiatives Sometimes you have people who are really good at developing businesses, but they already have a business, but they haven't done it as a cooperative before. So there's a lot to learn on that side. What does it mean that this is a co-op? How do we operate as a co-op? What about the legal structure? All of that. Um, then you have a lot of people, um, especially with the kind of growing movement around the new economy right now, I think a lot of people who are community organizers and social workers and 
um, activists and f folks who are interested in creating a better world coming into wanting to create cooperatives but without any actual business experience. So they may be really good at developing people or developing social movements or developing other things but don't have the, the business side. So we see kind of two major trends that we're trying to, to weave together with this, which is developing people and developing businesses. And to do that, we've identified five major topic areas. And so what I'll do next is just sort of show you a slide with each of the topic areas and say a word or two about it. Um, and then we'll <clears throat> kind of move into the Q&A. So the first area, um, you know, first and foremost, a cooperative is a business. If it's, if it's not successful as a business, it's not going to be able to achieve the social, environmental, or any other goals that the the founders and the members are trying to achieve with the cooperative. So there's a lot of aspects in the early phase or the growth phase that um, each team will need to be fluent in and, and um, potentially have, have workshops related to. So these types of topics will be um, you know, developing some targeted curriculum for and we may be partnering with some other organizations organizations that do business education for small businesses, potentially to deliver some of these workshops as well. Um, and again, this is a great example of, as you see, we say menu of topics adaptable to participants' needs. Um, so that what that does not mean is that each participant will say, oh, here's a menu. I'm going to choose these five things and not do the rest of it. It's not going to be quite that straightforward. It's going to be more of, um, you know, like I said, sort of a customized program that we'll develop together with you and then agree on at the outset. Um, that will be the set program for, for your team. And some of the teams, if they have a successful business already, you know, probably won't need a workshop on marketing because they're maybe doing that very well already. But some of the others may, may not know anything about marketing and that'll be a really core piece of this experience for them. Um, and that last bullet is just worth saying that there's um, one of the things that's so up front and center with cooperatives is balancing your business goals and your business success with your other goals that most of us bring to a cooperative effort. And so we'll also talk about kind of conceptually how do you navigate those tensions and what does that look like. Um, and through all of this, I should also say that we're planning to do, you know, really applied kind of learning, definitely very participatory popular education type of approach um, with a lot of kind of case studies as, and, and even applications, that's probably why the work between sessions is so important of you guys applying these ideas to your own challenges and situations and then being able to talk about that in the workshops. So the second area is people and culture, which is critical in any organization and certainly critical in a cooperative business. Um, so we'll do every, you know, the range of things that you see here from conflict management and just sort of self-management means sort of being a really productive and mature, healthy participant as a worker owner in a, in a worker cooperative. And we'll also look at some of the hard issues. And one of the trends I've observed in worker co-ops is that um, <clears throat> Like any mission-driven organization, most of us come to it with a lot of passion and get together with other people because we share that passion. And that's really important, but it sometimes muddies the waters in terms of being able to figure out, you know, is this person a good fit for this organization and able to, to do the role that he or she is here to do. So one of the things that, that worker co-ops struggle with a lot is sort of hiring, firing, evaluating, all that kind of stuff, and moving people from employee to worker owner all of those things. So there's a lot of really interesting, juicy aspects of people and culture that we'll be spending some time on. Um, next area, cooperatives, of course. Um, we'll do some fun stuff around the cooperative principles, the seven international cooperative principles, around the history of cooperatives in the US and other countries. Um, and we have an incredibly uh, rich community of existing worker cooperatives here. And so we'll hope to do a few site visits to Bay Area worker co-ops and also to use some of their stories and from, from co-ops in other parts of the country as well to illustrate some of the ideas that we're learning about in the workshops. So governance and management, um, critical. So in, in governance of worker co-ops, there's a whole spectrum ranging from you know, a collective type of approach like in Arismendi, for example, where, where a lot of decisions are made in teams and are made by everybody together, either at the team level or at the full cooperative level. And that's sort of one end of the spectrum of an approach to, to decision making in cooperatives. And then at another end of the spectrum would be having a board of directors, say, where the worker owners would elect the majority of seats on the board of directors, and that would be the way that they exercise that control over the cooperative business. Um, I should kind of add my favorite definition of a, of a cooperative is that it's a business that's owned and controlled by the members. So, so one way that governance can happen in a worker co-op is that the worker owners elect the majority of the board of directors and sit on the board themselves. 
Um, and you could, within that context, have a kind of somewhat traditional looking management structure within a worker co-op, or you might have a very non-conventional management structure. So one of the things we'll talk about in the course of the Worker Co-op Academy and do some kind of deep thinking and learning around together is thinking about what's the right management model for your worker co-op, right, and, and why, and how are you going to define the roles of the board and of any managers that you might have and of others, all the worker owners together, et cetera. Um, and leadership issues. So a, a colleague who I really respect who's a very kind of longtime leader in the worker co-op movement locally and nationally once said to me, leadership is a dirty word in our movement. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I think you're right for a lot of people and that's really too bad because cooperatives really need leadership and they need it diffused and spread throughout the organization. So we'll, we'll do some interesting work around leadership as well and decision making and effective meeting practice. And then our last area where um, we have some awesome expertise at the table um, with, with SELC, Ricardo's organization, and also Green Collar Communities Clinic and Sushil Jacob, um, who's our other core partner. So there will be really good um, workshops around the legal aspects um, of cooperatives, ranging from taxation to employment, governance, capital, and formation. And so with that, we just wanted you to kind of see all of this on one slide. Um, again, this is these are the sort of five, I guess it's six, isn't it? No, well, co-op, oh, I didn't talk about co-op development. Okay, there is actually a sixth area. We didn't have a separate slide on that, on co-op development. And by that, we mean specifically when a third-party entity, like a nonprofit, um, and sometimes not a nonprofit like the, the Arismendi cooperatives have their own development and support collective that's part of their network. But where a third party entity is working with community members and founding worker owners to, to launch and grow a worker cooperative that you know, then over time becomes more, more autonomous as they get to a stable point as a business. So we, we may very well have some nonprofits, um, some nonprofit teams in the academy who are going to be developing worker co-ops uh, together maybe with founding worker owners or, or just the the staff team, and that has its own set of kind of issues and complicated things to sort out. So that's another curriculum area that we'll be including for the folks for whom that's relevant. So that is the overview, and we're actually a couple minutes early, so that's good because I've been talking a lot, and you've been listening a lot. So thank you, everybody, for your, your kind of um, patience in, in taking this all in. And now we're ready, I think, to just open it up to, to questions, and Ricardo is going to be our moderator. And we'll move into a conversation. OK, so um, thanks, everybody, for uh, attending. And uh, so now is the time for your questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can, um, there's a question. Um, space you can you can type in your question and uh, if you want to uh, actually talk instead of um, write it in then I can unmute you so it's um, so now it's time for anybody's questions about the particulars um, around our co-op academy I'm not seeing any questions right now. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Now the questions are popping up. Okay. So, um, great. Thank you, everybody. So, I'm just going to start from the top. Um, Andrea asks, what are the main criteria that you're looking for in terms of a business that is trying to move from an LLC to a worker-owned co-op? So, um, Hillary, do you want to take that on? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a um, really interesting question. And the the general criteria that we're looking for in every team would, would definitely apply here. And that's about um, a, a business that looks like it's going to be a successful business, which if you're an existing LLC and, and doing well as a business, you may have that base already covered. Um, we're looking for increased job creation, so ideally a business that has some um, desire to grow and add jobs, and hopefully that, that some of the jobs in the company would be for low to moderate income workers as well. That's kind of, as I mentioned before, one of our core focuses of the program. 
Um, and then, yeah, I think if you're looking to convert to, to a worker co-op from another business form, we'd just be wanting to understand, and part of what the application will ask you to articulate is sort of, why are you planning to do that? And we'd be looking to understand, like, is that something you're just lightly considering? Is it something you're pretty sure you want to do? And, you know, we, we're, this is the first time we've done this program, and if it's um, a wild success, we'll certainly be making a big effort to make it an ongoing program, but there are a lot of things that we don't kind of know for sure at this point because we're experimenting, but we're certainly hoping that we'll have um, lots of people wanting to participate. And so part of the selection process is really to make sure we, um, since we only have space for five to seven teams, that we, we use those slots for folks who really want to move forward with becoming a worker cooperative. So that would be one of the questions we'd be exploring with you all if you're a business that is, is thinking about converting. And that's, that's a really exciting possibility for us because we think that, as Ricardo said, business conversions to worker ownership is, is one amazing way to grow this movement. Thanks, Hillary. Um, our next question is from Maya. And then just uh, she's asking uh, if we can speak to the, the day and times, the schedule of the actual um, co-op academy. So um, right now we're just, uh, we've, uh, part of the application was asking when people are most available. And so what it's looking like um, based off the applications that we've already received is that uh, it's probably uh, going to be a weekday evening um, and possibly on a Saturday morning. So that's, those are the times that we'll most likely be having the, um, the, the classes themselves, but it's still tentative. And as we are taking on applicants and interviewing the teams, we're basically going to see who, uh, what times work best for all the applicants and the actual participants of this program. So that's what, um, so right now, tentatively, I can say that it's leaning towards weekday evenings and um, possibly one Saturday a month, something like that. So, um, okay, Pamela has asked uh, asked if we have received applications. Yes, we have. Thank you, Pamela. Um, we've received, um, I think I checked yesterday, we've just received about half a dozen so far um, with uh, hopefully more coming in. Um, and Andrea asks, um, does a business that is converting to worker ownership need to have employees on board? I'll pass this back to um, Hillary. One second. Uh, this, I don't think there's any kind of set answer to that question, actually. So if you're, if you've already formed a business and you're planning to bring on employees and thinking about bringing them in as worker owners or converting before you bring them on, that would be a fantastic, actually, I think, scenario for, for our worker co-op academy. Um, so yeah, we, we don't have any cookie cutters we're trying to fit people into. And, and again, kind of the thing, main thing to ask yourself is like, are you really committed to either starting or growing a business if you already have one? And are you really interested in that being a worker-owned business? And is there, within the profile of who you think you'll be employing in the worker co-op, does that include low to moderate income folks? So let's see. Um, now another question is um, from the Oakland Bay Virtual um, Exchange Network. Is there any grant funding available for startups that will employ 50 low income workers? So um, let's see. Basically, right now, so we've, we're starting this uh, Bay Area Blueprint project through a grant. Um, the grant, though, did not fund the entire um, scope of work that we wanted to do, but we've decided to continue forward and, and try to um, get outside funding just to be able to um, pay for our times, pay for the work that's going into creating um, not only the co-op academy, but also the conversion and scaling um, components of the Bay Area Blueprint project. Um, so right now there's not, uh, uh, enough funding even to fund our current project. Um, so unfortunately we're not able to pass any additional funding on to, um, to the people or participants who go through the Academy. What I can say though about funding, uh, potential for individuals and teams that come through the, uh, worker co-op Academy is that we're speaking with, uh, different, uh, foundations and uh, grantors to possibly find some funding uh, 
so that uh, participants who come out of our Worker Co-op Academy successfully would have preferential treatment in uh, receiving some of those grants to help them start with their start their business off on the right foot. I'm going to pass it off to Hillary so she can um, speak more to that one second. Yeah, what, what Ricardo just mentioned about um, connections through the Academy to sources of funding is one thing that's that's worth mentioning um, in a little bit more depth. And so Rainbow Grocery Cooperative, which a lot of people probably know of, it's one of the sort of highest profile um, worker co-ops in the Bay Area nationally. Um, so they actually have a cooperative grant fund that has given funding for, for this Academy. And part of the reason they did that is that they were hearing from you know, some applicants who, who didn't seem to have all of the kind of skill sets or the sort of necessary experience yet to, um, for them to feel like they were ready to be successful with their grant support. Um, and so they really like the notion of the Worker Co-op Academy helping to fill a gap between of kind of some of the needs that are out there among people interested in, in worker co-ops. So, so they're, they're involved and supportive of the Academy and we've also been in conversation with some lenders um, who are interested in lending to worker cooperatives. And so, you know, I, I, rather than preferential treatment, it would probably be more like that um, these folks would be looking very kind of positively at the fact that, that a co-op had come through this um, program. So it wouldn't guarantee you funding by any stretch, unfortunately, but it would, I think, be, you know, helpfully make you more ready to be successful in applying for loans or grants through some of those programs that we're partnering with. Um, and, and just to that last question, I'm not sure everything that was behind it, that question about funding for, for larger worker co-ops, but if you're someone who's, who's working on one, we'd love to hear from you offline also to learn about what you're doing and happy to talk more. Sure, yeah, so there's another question about where all the classes will be held. And we actually don't know yet. So in, in a minute, if Ricardo wants to add, um, he can, because he's the noble uh, person leading the charge on finding a space. So we haven't yet determined that, but it will be in the East Bay. So it's probably going to be Oakland or Berkeley. We have another question about whether the entire team needs to attend every class or if you could rotate team members to different sessions. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and one that we can, I can give you a general answer to right now, but we'll be kind of figuring out the definitive answer over the next month as we kind of learn more about what types of projects are likely to be participating and, uh, and finalizing the design of the academy based on that. But the short answer is that we really think this program will be successful in being useful to you guys if your whole team participates in the vast majority or all of it together. Um, and certainly recognize that, you know, your team members probably will have different strengths and maybe holes in what they already know in their existing knowledge. Um, but at the same time to go through a learning process together and also that kind of preparation and debriefing that you'll do after each workshop together, 100% um, will be really, really valuable. We, we won't, I think, be really um, uh, super rigid about that. And we're, we're working on finalizing a sort of an attendance policy, if you will, not, not to sound like, you know, grade school, but just to really um, kind of motivate a deep commitment to the program so that people can get the most out of it. We'll, we'll probably have a policy that kind of combines wanting every, every individual in the team to attend at least, you know, two thirds or three quarters or something of the, the workshop time that's in your team's customized program. And then having the overall attendance um, add up to, again, the vast majority of the total workshop time in your program. And you know, it won't be 100%, but maybe it'll be more like 75 or 80%. So there'll be a little bit of flexibility, but we definitely think it'll be most valuable if the team participates pretty fully together as a team. Okay, sorry, we're just reading the next question. Um, so there's a question about um, if your availability kind of changes in the course of applying or if, if, you're, if we would be willing to reconsider an application um, if your availability changes. And absolutely, yeah, as you can see, this is not like a mass-produced program. We're very happy to be in conversation with any of the applicants before and during the application process. So yeah, if something changes um, after you submit your application, just reach out. Um, I think probably to Ricardo by email would be the best way to, to open up that conversation. Okay, we have another interesting question here. What if I'm a business owner with employees but no team? Um, and I'm guessing what that means is you have people working for you, but there's not an obvious set of people who would be the team to come into the academy. 
Um, yes, okay, great. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think that that's, that's maybe just something we could, we could talk with you about. I, you know, again, this is sort of designed for teams and our, our understanding of how co-op conversions are most successful is when you have an owner of a business who's really interested in worker ownership and you know willing to do the collaboration and have the patience and if the owner's exiting it can take longer if it's a co-op conversion than if they're just selling the business straight up um, so you need that kind of commitment on the owner side and you also need commitment on the employee side um, and so I'm seeing that there some of your employees might be interested but they're not sure and you know I think that that's actually fine because that's logical if they were if they were sure I'd probably be worried you know this is like a serious undertaking so so yeah why don't you um, talk with us about it Andrea and I think that if um, if you had a few employees who were interested enough to participate in this program that would go a long way towards I think building the team that you need even if the team isn't sort of set and strong and ready to go when you start Okay, oh, you're very welcome, Andrea. Um, so right now, I don't see any more questions on Stack, but um, there were a few questions that we've sort of uh, wanted to address just in, in case anybody didn't have. Oh, we have another question um, yeah, before we get to our uh, seated questions. Um, so the question is, do you have any recommendations about what colleagues would be best suited to be part of the team? So certain job titles, et cetera. Um, and I'll pass this back over to Hillary to um, talk, talk about. One second. That's a terrific question. I, I'm I'm loving this webinar because you know some of these are questions we anticipated, and, and some of them are ones we didn't anticipate. And I think there's going to be a lot of that in the academy itself. I think it's going to be very dynamic, so it's it's exciting. Um, so that's a great question. And Maya, just thinking off the top of my head about it, uh, what's coming to mind is it would be a really nice mix if you had. I'm imagining that you're maybe a big enough organization, that, and you have obviously a number of different job titles. That some of those might be in sort of more senior roles and some of them might be more entry level um, and maybe depending how big you are, you know, a bunch of things in between. And one thought that's coming to mind for me is, well, two things. One, one is that I think it would be good to have more than one person from kind of the leadership team or a management team if you do have that kind of a structure. Um, because you really want to have the, if those folks are going to be staying on when the business converts, of course you really want them to be deeply invested in this. Um, and then to also combine that with some more entry level um, workers or folks in other types of positions that aren't, you know, sort of technically considered management or leadership level. Um, and the reason is like, you know, one of my favorite things about my experience as a worker owner when I was in my 20s was that, you know, the founders of Equal Exchange were, you know, much older than me and had started this company and I didn't have any business experience when I came in. But as a worker owner at that level, I, I had real leadership opportunities and was able to serve on the board and was able to build my skills and contribute a lot to, to growing the company. And so I think that's what a, a cooperative structure can do um, in pretty amazing ways. So I think having people who are not in leadership roles would be would be a great mix for a team as well. So it probably really depends on your organization, but on a generic level, that's that's what comes to mind. Okay, so um, thanks for the questions. Um, I'm just gonna answer a few of the questions that um, we had prepared. Um, and so one has to do with how much is this going to cost? So Hillary, would you like to let us know how much um, the Co-op Academy is going to cost each uh, participant team? Sure. Um, so we have, as you may see, if you've read through the um, request for applications, you probably saw that we have a sliding scale fee that we're calling a reinvestment fee. And we really kind of debated this quite a bit in our organizing team um, because we don't want finances to be a barrier to anyone's participation. But true to the cooperative mindset and practice, we, we really do believe that kind of financial contributions are really important. And I actually don't love the term skin in the game, but I think it's commonly used. We all know what that means. So, you know, paying is part of how people really demonstrate and put their skin in the game, if you will. 
So the, the sliding fee scale, um, the low end is $250 and the high end is $2,000. And that's a fee per team. So it's not, it's not per individual, it's just a fee that your whole team would pay. And it just depends on how large of an organization you are and what your, your budget situation is. So we'd be kind of looking at sort of mostly self-selecting actually where you would fall on that scale. And the reason we're calling it a reinvestment fee is that <clears throat> um, if your team is successful in sort of the, the primary mission of this Worker Co-op Academy, which is to um, increase business success and growth, so either launching your business if it hasn't started yet or growing it if it's already existing, then we would actually return that fee to you to invest in your business and help support your, you know, directly into the business to help support its operating capital or whatever the business needs it for. So that's why we're calling it the reinvestment fee. You know, if you ended up going through the program and, and not moving forward on those goals, um, you know, that's a possible outcome here as well. And in that case, it would just come, it would just stay as a fee um, for, the, for the program. Okay, here's, here's another interesting question. Um, an employee who's interested in, in joining a team for the Worker Co-op Academy, um, is that the implication here? Um, and has also been tapped by another prospective co-op startup. Is there a conflict of interest? Um, I guess, Pamela, I'm not, I'm not totally understanding what the situation is. Um, yeah, Ricardo, if you want to take that. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question Yeah, about conflicts of interest and possibly having a single individual who possibly could be on multiple teams through the Co-op Academy. That's something that we'll have to figure out um, just by talking with that individual and with both teams and seeing um, which, which team or if that individual actually would stay on both. So it'd be a case-by-case -case basis and we could figure that out um, with our conversations uh, as you apply and as we have your... Uh, team interviews uh, for the academy itself. So, um, yeah. And let me see, there aren't any more questions currently. I'm just going to um, let Sushil, uh, who's uh, one of the core project partners, just uh, say hi to everybody for a minute. Let me, uh, let me bring him into the conversation. Sushil, can you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, just speak up, and if you can, uh, just introduce yourself and what you do, and, and uh, yeah, how you're participating oh, in the Academy. Thanks. Thank you, Ricardo and Hillary. This has been a really informative um, uh, webinar. I, I, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to We're doing an in-person uh, info session next week, so this is really good background um, for us. Um, I work at the East Bay Community Law Center, which is in Berkeley. Um, right next to the Berkeley Bowl, and we are actually a nonprofit affiliated with UC Berkeley Law School, and we provide legal services for all types of um, nonprofits and cooperatives. But and our focus is actually worker-owned cooperatives. So we work with the Sustainable Economies Law Center to do workshops um, to assist at their legal cafes, and then we take on clients directly and provide ongoing legal services to co-op startups in the community. So. Uh, we're really excited to partner on this academy and to be working with you in the classroom portion as well as hopefully in phase two when we do the um, legal counsel for um, co-ops that get into that part. Great. Thanks, Sushil. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure if you take the co-op academy, uh, you'll be hearing more from Sushil and seeing him a lot more as well. So that'll be great. Um, so I don't see any more questions, so we can just end a couple minutes early and everybody can get ready for the um, USA-Belgium uh, game. <laughs> um, let's see. So if you do have more questions, feel free to email me, um, at ricardo at ricardo at theselk.org. Um, it's at the bottom of the Worker Cooperative Academy web pages, so it should be easy enough to find. Um, and we can answer your questions uh, specifically. We also are going to be having an in-person info session that will basically be a lot of this same information, um, but with different people asking hopefully some uh, of the same and some different questions. We're going to provide this uh, recorded webinar on our website as well as the slides um, themselves. So you can look at the slides individually or you can watch this webinar again. 
Um, and we just want to remind everybody that the applications, um, we're going to start reviewing the applications um, in depth on July 11th, and we'll start uh, reaching out to teams to start scheduling those interviews um, uh, after, after that. And um, the final deadline for the uh, Academy applications are August 1st. So, oh, sorry, there's uh, one more question. Um, are there any handouts mentioned available at the end of the, any other handouts mentioned available at the end of the presentation? So, um, they, we have a uh, request for applications um, that we sent out in an email uh, a few weeks ago that I can send um, to everybody who was on this uh, webinar. I can also send the um, slides as well as a link to where you would be able to view this uh, webinar. Uh, to everybody who attended. Um, and uh, thank you everybody uh, for attending. We really appreciate it and we look forward to uh, seeing you all at the uh, Worker Cooperative Academy. Take care everybody.